Okay, so welcome to the um, Bible study in Romans. We're con we're actually picking up um, the first five verses of chapter five. Um, again, rehashing them. Um, Justin finished off with those last week, but um, they're crucial to the message that Paul gives us in all of his epistles. We are deemed right with God because of our faith period okay the finished work of the cross is what counts us as righteous um, Justin why don't you do me a favor and read one through five again we have been made right with God because of our faith now we have peace with him because of our Lord Jesus Christ through faith in Jesus we have received God's grace in that grace we stand. We are full of joy because we expect to share in God's glory, and that's not all. We are full of joy even when we suffer. We know that our suffering gives us the strength to go on. The strength to go on produces character. Character produces hope. And hope will never bring us shame. That's because God's love has been poured into our hearts. This has happened through the Holy Spirit who has who has been given to us so the holy spirit is given to us obviously the very second that we believe on jesus's finished work of the cross right that's the salvation message open to any and everyone who will call on the name of the lord that's what's calling on the name of the lord means um and god's grace is imputed on us and just like the king's seal, the king's stamp, the signet ring, he imparts upon us the Holy Spirit who lives within us. Okay, this is the third person of a trinity of the Trinity. It is a person. Okay, so this Holy Spirit dwells in us. We are sealed in the promise of the Holy Spirit the moment we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. 5-6 is very short, but it's oh so crucial for all of God's word. Go ahead, Justin, 5-6. At just the right time, Christ died for ungodly people. He died for us when we had no power of our own. So just the God's timing or at the just right time is enough material for 70 or 80 sermons without even looking God's God waits until the perfect time in his mind to let something come to fruition okay so just at the right time um, Christ died for ungodly people now he could have died the moment after Israel crossed the Red Sea and started bickering and moaning. But that wasn't the right time. The right time was when God knew that there was not going to be salvation because of Israel repenting and calling on a Messiah to get him out of this whole law thing. Right? Because the law was set up for one simple reason— to put a mirror in front of Israel to let them know you need to do this, do this, do this, do this in order to be acceptable unto me and it has to be perfect. It's impossible. Paul even says, why place a yoke upon the age of grace when we couldn't even bear it? Because one strike, you're out. One little slip up, you're out. And since we're born with sin nature, it's impossible. But God said, I got a redeemer for you. I have a Messiah. I have a deliverer. I just want you to acknowledge you can't do it under your own strength. Okay, so the law is perfect for those that are perfect, but you're not perfect. So call on me and I'll rescue you. He promised that in Genesis 3.15. 
uh, the seed of the woman will overtake the seed of the serpent and crush its head. Okay. All he wanted was them to realize we can't do it without you. We need your help. So at the right time was important to what we saw in the last three weeks of sermons to Moses. Okay, it wasn't at 40 years old when he got out of the kingdom and decided to take things in his own hand by slaying the Egyptian, hoping that his people would see him for who he is. It wasn't after another 40 years that God finally decided, okay, now's the time. Now you're ripe. He had to wait 80 years before he was ready, before God's time said, now. Right. And and people could have seen it from the outside, basically along your point um, of saying, oh, because Moses was brought up in the kingdom in Pharaoh's household. That's why he was able to deliver Israel. Right. So the glory would have been taken away from God. And uh, Moses' mindset wasn't um, in tune yet. He had to learn. He, lear he learned how to rule, but he had to also learn how to be humble, like you said. Right? And for some people, it takes 40 years. You know, <laughs> um, seems to be God's judgment time. But uh, again, in my own life, it was close to 40 years before... I finally went and did what he wanted me to do. We've seen it all through scripture, right? Um, when we look at um, my time has not yet come, like, like was here in this verse. Jesus said that on multiple occasions to his disciples, right? Uh, my hour has not come to his mother. Right. And so when they were trying to exterminate him because he didn't fit into their plan and he was ruffling feathers in their comfortable lifestyle, they tried to seize him. They, they were heading him towards a cliff, but they couldn't touch him because his hour had not come. So in the study notes right there on page 16, I did put in um, several places where he had said, my time has not yet come or implied that the time is not yet at hand, right? So if you ever want to look at those, they're John 2, 4, John 7, 30, John 8, 20, and it's implied in John 7, 6, and 7, 8. And in John 12, 23, and 17, 1, he said, my hour has not yet come, or my hour has come. Right. This was when God's timing was ripe and it, it was he was at the Garden of Gethsemane and he knew his time had come. OK, so God's timing is God's timing. Um, as I mentioned in the last three sermons, we noticed that Moses, um, God's timing was 80 years before he was ready. Abraham's timing was 100 years Right? A hundred years before God was ready to use Abraham to start this nation. Right? This promised seed. Or lineage of the promised seed. Joseph, as I mentioned last week in, in the message, 
um, it was probably close to 40 years where he had been beaten up by his brothers, basically, thrown into a pit, left for dead. Um, then he gets picked up by slave traders, gets sold into um, slavery. Potiphar's household picks him up. He gets in there. Okay, maybe things are going right now. I know God said I'm going to be a leader. I'm going to rule my brothers and my father, actually. Um, and then he gets thrown in jail. He's got to be going, what? Are you kidding me? This is not a good start. Well, we know that he was sold at 17. He spent 13 years in Potiphar's household and prison time. At probably close to 40 years, or I'm sorry, at least seven years went by because he described the dream to Pharaoh where there would be seven years of plenty. And then probably two years into the seven years of famine, Abraham said, hey, go to Egypt. We need food, man. We're starving. So... This is a matter of a long time. Meanwhile, Joseph lost his mother. She died giving birth to Benjamin. Okay, so he's got to be like, am I missing something? You know, where's this promise of me being the anointed one? Well, not far after that, God came through, right? He said, I needed time. I needed to make this all come together so it's perfect. If I'd have done it any other way, I wouldn't have been able to take 70 people and we know through Scripture turn them, turn them into a million and a half in captivity in Egypt, right? If it didn't all exactly go as planned into my time that I've destined for things to happen. Um, over the 400 years of captivity, God felt, okay, now you're big enough and you've seen how bad things can be. So now I'm going to take and make out of you a nation of my own. And I'm not only going to take you out of Egypt, but I'm also going to plant you in your own land. And I'm going to give you all the rules and regulations. I don't want you to intermingle. I want you to keep your nationality. And I want you to live for me as a nation of priests. Right? That was their, their destiny. Now, even though God scattered them for their rebellion and everything else in 70 A.D., they're the only nation to have ever existed that lost their homeland, scattered about all the world, but yet did not lose their nationality. Okay, that's, that's God intervention firsthand. A little nation the size of New Jersey spread out through all the world and did not acclimate. Okay, that only happens by the sovereign hand of God. Um, when you think about it, the Lord thought it necessary to have 400 years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament, which was a rough time. There was a lot of fighting going on. There was a lot of uh, what's next going on. There was a lot of um, let's see if we miss something in Scripture. Of course, you only got the Old Testament going on. But God didn't wait 40 days. He waited 400 years before the time was right for him to introduce the Messiah. Okay? That's because that was the right time. Not before, not after. Um, and now it's been approximately 1,954 to 1,991 years where God has said, 
I'm going to hold on to the age of grace until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And then I'm going to start the clock ticking again with Israel for those final three years. Right? We remember that Jesus rode in the triumphal entry into Jerusalem was exactly 430 years. No, 420 years, which left 90 or 70, 483 years. Thank you. From the moment of rebuilding of the wall to the time that he rode in on the triumphal entry, leaving seven years remaining before the kingdom would be set up. Of course, so this tribulation period will pick up those seven years once the age of grace is over, when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Um, God always has his timing be so that the best possible outcome can be achieved. And it might seem to us, and especially non-believers, right? Non-believers will be, where is this promise of the one that you say is coming to set up his kingdom, right? And they're going to be mocking us even more, scripture says, as the time gets closer. It's been 2,000 years because God is long-suffering and he doesn't want anyone to perish. So if he pulls the plug too soon, there's going to be people perishing that could have made it. He knows what he's doing, right? Um, verses 7 through 8, please. It is unusual for anyone to die for a godly person. Maybe someone would be willing to die for a good person. But here is how God has shown his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. So while we were still sinners, he loved us. He loved us because he knew we would come to him through his son Jesus. What this scripture says, and, and I know you look perplexed on this, but what this scripture says is, a good person who wants to do the right thing will probably gladly give up his life for another good person or for like a family member or from, a, you know, my life is not as important as theirs. But how many good people would give up their life for a, um, a dirt bag? Right. That's what the scripture is saying. Right, and, and, and that's why I was looking perplexed, because at the beginning of 7, it says godly person in this scripture, but does it mean ungodly? No. What? Uh, let's read it again. Here it says, um, it is unusual for anyone to die for a godly... It is unusual for anyone to die for a godly person. Maybe someone would be willing to die for a good person. Wow, now I'm getting confused. Yeah, because, like, to me, in my mind, it's, I'm thinking, wait a minute, you're comparing good to godly, but isn't godly good? So wouldn't it be ungodly? You have a very valid point there. Now I'm going to go look at, look at 5 other... 7 in the New King James. Hang on, let me switch over to a different one, too. Yeah, read the ESV. Tough wording. The meaning is, though, that it's understandable that um, someone would. Oh, here. Okay. I, I, I got one. All right. This is okay. amplified. This makes much more sense just by tweaking the words a little bit. Okay. Let's go for it. Now it is an, an extraordinary thing for one to willingly give his life, even 
for an upright man being a godly person. Though perhaps, though perhaps for a good man, one who is noble and selfless and worthy, someone might even dare to die for him. So, okay, good. That, Thank that makes you. a little bit more sense. And it does. And that's why, and we'll see this a little bit later on too, when we start to discuss the angel of the Lord capitalized. It's important that we look at different um, different versions of the Bible, okay? Um, some are a little easier to understand. Some have deity capitalized. Some have meanings that are a little bit deeper. Um, well, so what you the just nailed it. Out of Greek and Arab and Hebrew to English don't really necessarily always make sense because their words are very different from ours. And the Hebrew and the Greek language have so many more words than the English language does. Not commonplace. Yeah. Right. 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 Well, so if they were saying the same thing in two different ways. Right. But, and then it goes to the third, then it goes to the third extreme, and it says. Right. So God decided I'm going to give up everything I have, even for the sinner. Yeah. Right. So it just escalates that um, or deescalates from a human way of thinking what we're willing to do for a good person versus what God is willing to do for a lost person. It, it, to me, it kind of seems like. Um what what's making sense to me now is that if you were to ask somebody to put their life on the line for somebody else it would be an amazing thing to have somebody voluntarily give up their life for you right without any extraordinary purpose and and even in the best of circumstances it's hard to find somebody willing to give up their life for the best of people right it's even Sometimes we find heroes that will, at the drop of the hat, give up their life or risk their life to save somebody else's that they don't know who right. might be a good person. They might not be a godly person. They might be a good person. They don't know. And then, like you said, in the third extreme now is God giving up his deity, his son, for everyone. Right. Good, bad, righteous, right. bad, unrighteous, evil. Yep. At the chance that we might be able to be better at some And I always like to point out not only his only son, but his everything. His son was his everything. To be forever changed. That's something we can't fathom. And you can't put it into words, just like agape. You know, it's not fathomable to put into words God's agape love. Right, but it's pointed out right here in this: while we were still sinners, God, di uh, Christ died for us. Um, then going on to verse nine, please. The blood of Christ has made us right with God, so we are even more sure that Jesus will save us from God's anger. So the righteousness of God, or, uh, or the blood of the blood of Christ was brought about to pay for sin because back in the garden, the first sacrifice was a blood sacrifice. Adam sinned and Eve sinned, Eve sinned because of Adam partaking. And so God made a tunic of skins for them to cover them up. Um, that involved the sacrifice. We know that throughout the Old Testament, there is no remission of sins without the shedding of blood. Right? And the whole law system 
said that you have to um, shed a blood, uh, shed the blood of an innocent animal, a pure lamb, a dove, whatever the case may be, bring it to the high priest to get your sins covered up, right? Just to to get them kind of hidden, um, and it involved something had to die, right? Moses or uh, Abraham was asked to take Isaac up onto the top of the mountain and to sacrifice him, his one and only son, um, to show his um, love for God. And of course, then what happened was that the, um, the ram was caught in the thicket in order to make it happen, right? But the ram did have to die. So the shed blood of Jesus Christ was once and for all done. There is no more shedding of blood that's necessary to cover up sins, much less shedding of blood that's necessary for sanctification. It's kind of hard to believe that a dove would take care of something anyway. <laughs> In the he, grand scheme of things, I'm just saying. He was the to only one. No, he, no, I'm saying like a dove. Oh, like in, dove, the, in the old dove, Testament right. days. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I brought in this pigeon that I found. Uh, right. You know, well, this, uh, you know, I had adultery with my neighbor's wife. Uh, no, no, that, that would problem? be a lamb. Oh, that'd be a lamb. Okay, yeah, right. okay. So a dove is maybe okay. uh, I lied to my mom <laughs> and said said her cooking was good. Yeah, okay. You know, okay, you lied. You said mom's cooking was good, and it was, really wasn't. So that's a dove, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> ten, five, ten. Once we are God's enemies, no, sorry, once we were God's enemies, but we have been brought back to him because his son has died for us now. Now that God has brought us back, we are even more secure. We know that we will be saved because Jesus Christ lives. So I love it how scripture reassures us um, almost every 15 minutes. Okay, so here we have verse end of 9 and into 10. It says, so we are even more sure that Jesus will save us from God's anger. Once we were God's enemies, but now we have been brought back to him because of his son. This is definitive proof that we will never be around at the time of God's wrath. Okay? Scripture makes it very clear. We are not appointed to God's wrath. Okay? We were once under God's anger, but because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we are now no longer God's enemies. We cannot be around during the seven years that is worse than the flood. Because that is held separate for God's enemies. That's a promise. We are the bride of Christ. Okay. And so just like. Isaac. Went out to look for a wife. And through the feeding of the watering of the the animals however it happened rebecca started to walk towards isaac isaac realized this is the one for me and he headed towards her okay the male did not approach the woman but he knew that that was going to be his bride It wasn't Isaac. I thought Isaac stepped towards. And received, right, and received her. Right. Instead of her going into the tent, he came out of the tent to receive her. And that's a, a picture of what Christ will do to his bride, the church, before the time of the tribulation, okay? He's going to come out of the tent, meet us in the air, and get us out of the way. 
he's going to take a step out. He's not going to go the whole distance, but he's going to meet us. We don't have to go all the way to him. He's going to meet us in the air. There's so many different parts of scripture that give us reassurance that, yes, it's going to be ugly, right? Jesus said it. Hey, I'm sorry, but they hated me first, and they're going to hate you. There's going to be tribulation. Yes. Worse than the world. Right. Worse than ever before, including the flood, he tells us, right? Right? And so, not only that, but the flood was instantaneous. The water came from under the ground. A third of the water, which is basically the Atlantic Ocean, came down all at once, and it rained. We're talking washing machine, immediate destruction. There was no, hey, do you got an umbrella I can borrow? No, it was done. This is seven years of one calamity after the other and two-thirds of the world being wiped out. Angry people still shaking their fist at God and wishing that they could just check out, but that's not even going to be allowed to happen. Torment upon torment. Basically the same wrath that Jesus received on the cross for our sins, these people are going to have to pay for themselves. So, in 5.10, like we just read, because Christ lives, we know that we will be saved because Christ lives. That simply states that because he was resurrected, we are guaranteed to live because we will be resurrected with him. I'll go into that a little bit further um, in a second. But on one of the pages, I printed out the scriptures, Romans 8, 11, and Ephesians 1, 3 through 7. Uh, which one you want first? Um, go ahead and read them both. Just call off which one you're reading. All right. We'll start with Romans 8, 11. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you so that the God who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your bodies. He will do this because of his spirit who lives in you. Once again, to refresh, once we believe the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit lives within us, that's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, who is also going to raise us from the dead. Okay, go ahead. Okay, Ephesians 1, 3 through 7. Give praise to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Those blessings come from the heavenly world. They belong to us because we belong to Christ. God chose us to belong to Christ before the world was created. He chose us to be holy and without blame in his eyes. He loved us. So he decided a long, long ago to adopt us. He adopted us as his children with all rights children have. He did that. He did it because of G what Jesus Christ has done. It pleased God to do it. All those things bring praise to the glory to his glorious grace. God freely gave us his grace because of the one he loves. We have been set free because of what Christ has done. Because he bled and died, our sins have been forgiven. We have been set free because God's grace is so rich. So that's basically what verse 11 of Romans 5 is trying to tell us. It's because of what Christ did. Okay, for stepping up to the plate and saying, okay, I'm going to put myself on the cross. It's never because of anything that we can do. It's by the grace of God with 
the agreement of Jesus Christ, um, we are full of joy. Um, right? We are full of joy in God because of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of him, God has brought us back to himself. So um, we'll save that Luke 135 for a little bit further in the study. All right, so now let's move on to Romans 5.12. Sin entered the world because of one man, one man sinned, and death came because of sin. Everyone sinned, so death came to all people. So, there's nothing we can do to change that. When we're born, our blood lineage goes back to Adam. Okay, because everyone that's ever been born has the same sin nature blood passed down from their father in the lineage of Adam. Okay, and the only way to break that chain is to have a separate father bring a child upon the earth who is, who has potential of being sinless and that's why the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary okay because Mary's blood was also sin filled right because every person born has that sin nature in their blood but the Holy Spirit's blood was the blood that was in Jesus Christ's veins none of Mary's blood right so he had the opportunity to be born without that sin nature in his blood and that's why it's so important that we understand that he's the only one that could have redeemed sinners by his death by his spilt blood because he wasn't redeeming his own sin. Right? You can only be a scapegoat if you're innocent to take somebody's guilty um, judgment or penalty. So that's where now you can read that Luke 135. I printed it out. No, I'm just sorry. Just give me one second. All right, Luke 1, 35. The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come to you. The power of Most High God will cover you. So the Holy One that is born will be called the Son of God. And so there it is. You know, he's going to be holy. He's going to be the Son of God. He's going to have pure blood in his body. And now it's just up to him to live a whole life without sinning. Right, those are the two prerequisites that were set forth way before the earth was, was um, well, actually not true, um, in the garden. So, five twelve. Um, sin entered the world because of one man's sin. Death came because of sin. Everyone sinned, so death came to all people is simply because of Adam's sin in the garden. Um, no way of escaping it. You can't do enough good deeds, right? It's all, it's all over with. 13 and 14. Before the law was given, sin was in the world. This is certainly true, but people are not judged for sin when there is no law. Death ruled from the time of Adam to the time of Moses. Death ruled even over those who did not sin as Adam did. He broke God's command, but Adam also became a pattern of the Messiah. The Messiah was the one who was going to come. Right. So because of one man, right, um, sin came into the world. And because of one man, um, all could be sin cleansed. Right, so the difference is only the capitalization, if you will. Um, 
one man being um, Adam. Uh, let's see here. I hear people. But Adam, Adam also became a pattern of the Messiah. So the pattern of the Messiah is because of Adam, sin entered the world. And because of Jesus Christ, sin was excluded from the world for all those that would take it. Now we go on to 15, 515. God's gift can be compared with Adam's sin. Many people died because of the sin of that one man. But it was even more sure that God's grace would also come through one man. That man is Jesus Christ. God's gift of grace was more than enough for the whole world. So I guess I jumped the, uh, the gun on explaining that. But yes, it's because of one man... Sin entered the world, and because of one man, Christ Jesus, that sin can be abolished in anyone that would have to ha would choose to have it. It points to the seed of the woman, right? Um, seed is capitalized in the New King James, the NIV, and several other. Um, scriptures or, or versions um, but not in some versions and that's what makes it tough because there's also a seed for the serpent um, if you don't know which one's deity and which one's just regular uh, it's necessary to be able to um, look at different scriptures to understand what is meant I think it's important that when you get into advanced Bible study that you go through the different versions to see are we talking about deity are we talking about God himself or are we talking about something like an angel something hierarchy or are we talking about just a person. I saw that when we were going through the um, through the sermon with Pastor Daniel about the angel of the Lord coming to Moses when he was talking to the angel of the Lord. And that's why I printed out these other two um, scriptures, the additional scriptures. Um, because the angel of the Lord is capitalized in that first sheet. Um, Justin, you got that? Genesis 16, 7 through 13? Yep. Okay. And I want us to be aware that this is the pre-incarnate Christ. Okay. This is God the Son. Um, not only does it give it away from... The capital L-O-R-D, which is always God the Son, and, and we'll go over that in a second. But angel is capitalized. So throughout the whole Old Testament, angel of the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, all point to the Son of God. It is never found in the New Testament. Because the Son of God is actually on the earth. So there's no need to talk about the Son of God or the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ because he's actually standing there. Mm. Okay. So Genesis 16, 7 through 13. Why don't you read that? Now the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to the sure and he said, Hagar, is that Saria? Sarai's. Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress Sarai. 
the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, so do so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has heard your affliction. He shall be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him. And he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, I Have I also here seen him who sees me? So she recognized that the angel of the Lord capitalized was actually God himself. Okay, and that's something that in, in, for example, this version that we're looking at now, the New International Reader's Version, it doesn't come so clear. Um, there's a couple of other tidbits that you can look at in Scripture if, for example, you're not sure. The Son of God or Deity or the Incarnate Christ will accept worship. In the Old Testament. An angel like Michael or Gabriel will never accept worship. Okay. And they could be a bright, glowing, white, godly figure that, that brings people to their knees or, or fall flat on the ground. But angels never receive worship unless their name is Lucifer. Right. Because he seeks that. Not because he's deserving of it, but because he's delusional. So then we'll go on to Genesis 16, 7, 3, 7 through 13 for another example. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad. Or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram, caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said by myself I have sworn says the Lord because you have done this thing and not and have not withheld your son your only son blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is on the sea seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. So once again, that was God himself, God the Son, right, saying, Abraham, stop. I'm going to provide the sacrifice for you. Now I know, um, how, how would he say it? Um... Now I know you fear God, right? Reverential fear again. Um, so angel of the Lord is one of the examples, um, as we said um, in those two scriptures. You can see that that's actually um, God the Son himself. Um, there's other times when the angel of the Lord appears. Um, Jesus Christ and before he's Jesus right the son of God um, I wrote down there for your own reference if you ever want to look at it Exodus 3 numbers 22 judges 2 judges 6 judges 13 Zechariah 1 12 and of course the capital L O R D is 
Yahweh, Jehovah, is always the Son of God. And that's why Jehovah is I am, and Jesus had the full right to say, before Abraham was I am. It ties it all in, right? The only person that's allowed to call himself Yahweh or Jehovah is the person that we know as Jesus Christ on this side of the cross and the Son of God on the pre-cross period, the Old Testament. So whenever we see that word capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, Yahweh, um, that is the theopony of the Son of God. Um, it's found 6,823 times in the Old Testament, and of course never once in the New, because he's actually on the ground. So he doesn't have to refer to himself um, as a theopony, because he's actually in living color. Right? So you won't find it in the New Testament. Romans five sixteen through 18. The result of God's gift is different from the result of Adam's sin. That one sin brought God's judgment, but after many sins, God's gift made people right with him. One man sinned, and death ruled over all people because of his sin. What will happen is even more sure than this. Those who receive the rich supply of God's grace which rule, will rule with Christ. They will rule in his kingdom. They have received God's gift and have been made right with him. This will happen because of what the one man, Jesus Christ, has done. So what he's saying here is, yes, Adam, uh, because of Adam, sin came in the world. And because of Christ, sin is potentially taken out of the world from whoever will accept it. But it's much more than that. Not only are we cleansed from sin because of Jesus Christ, we are given the right to reign and rule with him. Those who receive the rich supply of God's grace will rule with Christ. They will rule in his kingdom. That's why it says that it's even more than this. Right? The promise of it's not only that we're in and now we can be good peasants in heaven. No, our, our faith is has made us so much more than that in God's sight. We actually have authority. We are counted as brothers and sisters of Christ, joint heirs. So it's not only crossing the finish line, it's exponentially more than that. Again, not because of what we've done besides our testimony. Are, are accepting Jesus Christ, but it's because of what he's done to get us in there, to get us to that position. Then we look at... I guess I didn't finish 18. I think you meant to, to read all three. Okay, go ahead. That's, that's my bad. So one man's sin brought guilt to all people in the same way one right act made people right with God. That one right act gave life to all people. So, it, he's beating this home, right? Because of Adam, this is the predicament we're in. Here's the escape. And not only is it an escape, but it's so much better than that. There's so much more than just an escape. And also, um, that one right act, the finished work of the cross made us right with God. Now, this right with God is not strong enough. This right with God is he looks at us as if we are Jesus Christ himself. That makes us his own. Exactly what he intended to do in the garden. 
to make us a part of his family. Not just a forgiven parolee, but we're sanctified. We're pure in his eyes because of our acceptance of his one and only son. And that's why Paul makes it clear. You can, you can be of this tribe, what you're born into, one man, or you can be in this family, one man. It's that simple. Choice is yours. You can work all you want and you're still going to be here. Or you can not work at all, but have faith and be here. Free for nothing. Let's go on to 19. Many people were made sinners because one man did not obey, but one man did obey. That is why many people will be made right with God. So Adam didn't obey by what? Uh, he took a bite of the, the fruit, which he wasn't supposed to do. He was supposed to protect the tree. Right. And how did Jesus, how did Jesus obey? Uh, I'll give you a hint. It happened in the garden. Oh, that's right. When he what? was, uh, yeah, yeah. When he when he's saying, "Let the cup pass from my lips this time," and then he said, um, uh, "Not my will, but your will be done." Exactly that obedience, just like you you both said, and and everyone else thought. But yes, it's that obedience of you're saying this and I'm going to do it. I don't want to do it. Not my will, your will be done is obedience. You said don't do this, but I think I'm going to anyways. It's having faith that what he's got lined up for us is the best possible thing that could happen. Again, right? Yeah. The best possible solution. And God could have stopped and said, okay, if you believe on my son Jesus Christ, you're going to be um, in. Okay? And you'll all have your jobs and you'll all be fed and you'll, you know, you'll have a decent place to stay. No. He goes... All the way. He says, I'm going to adopt you. You're mine now. And now I don't have one son. I have millions of sons. And I have millions of daughters. That's how far he goes. But it cost him everything. Right? So by one man's non-obedience, this is what happens. By one man's obedience, this is what could happen. All right. So um, then we go on to 520 and 21. The law was given so that sin would increase. But where sin increased, God's grace increased even more. Sin ruled and brought death, but grace rules in the lives of those who are right with God. The grace of God brings eternal life. That's because of what Jesus Christ, our Lord, has done. So, again, when I read that in all the different versions, it kind of was a two by four against the head. Right? Because it, it's seeming to say that sin would increase... Because of the law. All right? But the law was designed so that sin wouldn't increase. It's a tough one to look at. But. Right. Right, and so to show them 
right, um, that you can try all you want, but you're going to start going further and further and further into the, the mess, right? Because anything you do under your own power to try and please God is going to keep you further and further away from God, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's um, because anything we do on our own power to try and make ourselves feel better about ourselves and to show off before God is filthy rags, right? We just saw that. And so all we're doing is heaping filthy rags on top of filthy rags and saying, well, uh, I'm getting closer. Yeah. Right. Yep. This is exactly what the scripture is saying. Yep. That's me snow plowing this year, right? The more I spin those tires in the mud, the deeper I get. And when the axle's stuck on the ground, I look like an idiot. And I have to call for help. Right? Right. Yeah, we've pulled each other out a few times. So. Right. But the, but the, when today when I was doing my, my daily um, lose the fat walk, um, I was listening to Les Feldick. And this is what he said, and I love the way he put this. He said, the law was set up almost like a married couple doing this. The husband says to the wife, hey, listen, you're going to live under my roof, and here's what I require of you to do. And the wife says, okay, well, if you're going to be my husband, this is what I require that you need to do. It's still a marriage, but it's not based on love. Okay? It's based on legalism. It's based on the law. Okay? These are the rules, and there's no love in this relationship. That same husband and wife do the unwritten things that the husband would like, and the wife does the unwritten things, or the husband does the unwritten things that the wife would like, are still the same requirements, but they're doing it out of love. That's the difference between law and and grace right on this side of God's plan we are under grace because of what Jesus did and our acceptance thereof so we do what God would want us to do out of love Amen. right which is exactly what he wanted Israel to do Yes, exactly. Yep. Right, exactly. Right. The Energizer Bunny, right? I love you, God. I love you, God. I love you, God. I need a new battery. I love you, God. I love you, God. Right? That's not, that doesn't, that doesn't count. And that's what Israel was doing. Right? And they were supposed to get the Gentiles involved. And the Gentiles probably would have said, hey, I don't think you guys are going about this right. 
because this is impossible for us to be able to do. Let's call on that God to redeem us from this law. But they got more and more pompous, right? Dug their tires in deeper and deeper and started to make money off of this. The money changers that Jesus turned the tables over on were because if your sacrifice wasn't good, you wasted your trip. So you better buy one of the sacrifices from the temple that costs five times as much. And you can't do it with your Greek denarii. You got to trade it in for temple coins at an exorbitant rate. Meanwhile, they're, they're driving their Porsche um, chariots around, right? And they're dressed in Gucci robes. <laughs> and they all got the flat screen TVs at home, right? And you're scraping ends meat because you called your mother-in-law's cooking bad. <laughs> the dove, right? 47 bucks for a dove? Are you kidding me? You should have thought of that before you called your mother's food bad. So it's just one big teachable moment. Got to learn how to love. Right. Love God. And, and, the, and, and why do we love though, right? Because God loved us first. While we were yet sinners... And this is everybody. I said it last Sunday, but this is open to everybody. God created everybody for a, rela a longing for a relationship with him and with the ability to be his children. There was no mistakes made. And so once we are a child of his, regardless of what age, it was exactly the age that God had planned for us to become his ch child. Then we want to love on other people because we are set free. There was no love going on in the Old Testament. It was work, 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 work. Israel was blessed physically. The blessings that came upon Israel were land, wealth, prosperity. Um, we are blessed by love, right? They had the law, and we went over this before, but it bears repeating. They had the law chiseled out on stone, right? Do not do, do not do, do not do. We have the law written on our hearts, and it's do love God above everything else. Do love your neighbor above yourself. And we gladly do it out of gratitude for the love God gave us first. Sounds a lot like what people do these days. We've gotten really good at getting good at what we do and making the money and setting up our house and having the things we need. But we can't take it with us is the old saying. And so there's a bigger lesson to learn before we kick the bucket and meet our creator, as they also say, that there's something that we got to hold on to that we take with us to the next life. And it isn't the money and it isn't the stuff right. we accumulate. No trailers following hearths. Yep. And, you know, it's just like the guy that was super wealthy. You know, he said, hey, listen, my time is up. And he called on God please just let me take one suitcase with me and God said all right you've been a good man and take one suitcase with you so he gets up there in St. Peter's you know he goes through customs at the pearly gates and he says what he got in there and he says well you know I got I brought my wealth with me so he opens it up it's full of gold and they all start laughing, Peter and everybody else. Are you kidding me? You brought pavement up here? <laughs> right? Streets are paved with gold, yep. 
Yeah, because what we have... <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, come on. We all know that all dogs go to heaven. Come on. <laughs> yeah, right? Cats, uh, maybe not so much. <laughs> all I can tell you Rabbits is... Are in. <laughs> all I can tell you is that heaven is full of animals. And I can't picture... Um, God giving us a loved pet um, that we nourish and that we take care of and not being able to see that pet again in its glory, right? Because we serve a beautiful God. I've had a few, yeah. It's the accumulation. Okay, all right. He's 20, that, that's a lot. So if you go 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep, 1,500 miles high, that's the new heaven and the earth, you can fit 100 quadrillion people on there. So I think there's room. And it might be plus, like downsizing. He might shrink us a little bit anyway. Uh, you know, pack so plus, <laughs> plus, plus... We will have bodies like Christ. And I wasn't joking when I said that Daniel and Rebecca can go have lunch on Venus. Why not? The whole world is God's. And we are God's children. And we will be able to worship God anywhere. Right? So, I mean, there's nothing nicer than having a picnic underneath the 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 nice sunny day underneath a tree um, with your loved ones worshiping God or the fellowship luncheons that we have here. You know, why can't we praise God while we're sitting on Neptune with our with Peter and Paul and, you know, and, and Noah? That might be the time out bench. It's a little chilly over there. Yeah, right. <laughs> the thing is that we can't even fathom what awaits us. Um, and so God says, don't worry about, you know, um, your children. Don't worry about anything else. Love on me. I'll take care of the rest. And Paul wasn't even allowed to talk about it, right? Because of how perfect and unbelievable it's going to be. All right, that's probably a good place to wrap it up because we're just about to hit Romans 6. Okay, so um, we did... Uh, da, 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 da. 5, 20, 21. Right, yeah, so let's stop at uh, 5, 20, and 21. We went over that. Um, you try and live by the law under your own works, you're just going to dig your tires in. Um you do the law because it's written on your heart and you're successful, right? It's all dependent upon with Jesus Christ or without. All right, so we'll leave it off there. And then um, next week we'll start uh, living a new life in Christ.